let's kick off since we've hit um, the hour um, and, and welcome to the final live session of the West Cork History Festival 2021. Um, as I think most of you will know by now, there are uh, there have been both live and pre-recorded sessions and the, the pre-recorded sessions are all on the website. Um, so please uh, take a look at those, but we're we're getting to the end of, of a, a consideration of um, two interconnected themes broadly this weekend, one Ireland in 1921 and the other aspects of Ireland and empire. And the theme of a conflict one way or another has run through all of them um, and how we remember that and what we choose to forget as in a fairly lively session uh, just now we were we were considering in relation to uh, the different kinds of selective memories about about engagement in empire um, and in our final speaker we have somebody who I think is better qualified than most to think about what we choose to remember and how when it comes to the experience of of violence I don't think Fergal Keane will need any introduction from me but simply to mention that alongside his um, his reporting for which of course he is famous. He has written a number of uh, history books. Um, uh, the, his treatment of the, the Battle of Kohima in a way about a, a, a different moment in the retreat from empire to the ones that we've just been thinking about just now. And his book Wounds on the revolutionary period um, in Kerry in particular, I think really uh, striking for its the breadth of its humanity. So, um, I think all of us will will benefit from listening to him. Fergal, thank you, and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think the first thing I need to say is commiserations to any Kilkenny people who may be joining us today. There'll always be another chance. And apart from that, I'm going to entirely desist from triumphalism uh, of any kind uh, today. I am a serial witness to war and civil conflict. For me, it would have been impossible to do that work without having a passionate interest in history. And that attachment to history is to do with saying what happened, not what I wish had happened. If it was the human habit to objectively take the facts of the past and ask how we might behave now in order to avoid catastrophe, I would speak more often of the lessons of history, but because too often we take only the lessons that suit us, I'm uncomfortable with the phrase, the lessons of history. History is complex, as complex as the multiple personalities and circumstances, social, economic, environmental, psychological, which drive it forward. I reject as a false choice that between dates, battles, treaties, great personalities, and the oral history of the common man or woman, the best history weaves these together. There is what happened. Why, how, to whom, how it felt, what came after, and what it might tell us of what is to come. My own special area of interest and my subject matter today is the trauma caused by war. I have strong personal reasons for this interest. 18 months ago, I decided that I could no longer function as a witness to war. I had been officially diagnosed with what is called complex post-traumatic stress disorder caused by repeated exposure to traumatic incidents in conflict zones. Over three decades, I had gone back to the wars again and again until my mind and body could no longer obey the commands of my instincts. I broke down and took a decision that I wouldn't ever return to an active battlefield. That has prompted a long period of self-examination and it's meant delving deep into the roots of my preoccupation with war and human suffering. And it's taken me back far beyond the wars of today. As a writer and as a PTSD patient, it sent me back not only into the experiences of war in my lifetime, but deep into the trauma from which I believe my own fascination with war sprang the conflict on this island, which set me on the road to becoming a war correspondent. I'm very conscious that I speak today in our season of centenary commemorations when we remember events whose influence was once 
profoundly traumatic in the lives of individuals. Here, I'm going to consider the psychological effects of violence on both victims and perpetrators. There may be a larger moral conclusion to be drawn from all of this about all war everywhere. But I trust in your own judgment not to tell you what to think. My own experience of conflict began as a journalist in the north of Ireland in the 1980s and has in the decades since encompassed most of the major and many of the smaller wars of our time. From Portadown to Rwanda to Iraq to Afghanistan and on and backwards, I've seen firsthand what war does to human beings. It is something that I see in the daylight and in my dreams. Civil war, genocide, conventional war, invasions, insurgencies and counterinsurgencies have filled much of my adult life. But it's only been in my later years that I've come to realize that part of what sent me to the battlefields as a reporter was rooted in the stories of my own people, the stories I was told and the stories I wasn't told. I believe the path to my becoming a witness to war began long before I was born, just across the border in County Kerry. It began in the agonies of the revolution and civil war, which brought into being the Irish Free State and the state of Northern Ireland. From a very early age, I was conscious of a certain idea of the history of those times. It was a story of heroism, a grandmother and granduncle who fought the Black and Tans, who worshipped Mick Collins and took his side in the Civil War. There were stories of daring escapes from the enemy, a world of gaunt men in trench coats hiding out in bogs and lonely farmhouses. Complicating questions could intrude. I had a maternal grandfather who fought with the IRA in Cork, yet whose father, my great-grandfather, had served the empire loyally as a sergeant in the Royal Irish Constabulary. And there were the ghost stories, the story of the green shadow that passed through the rooms of my grandmother's house at night was, I now understand, a symbolic representation of a murder that took place on the street outside. The shooting dead of a policeman within sight of the family home where his wife and children waited to welcome him back for lunch. But in the stories I was told, the blood was missing. The mess of mutilated bodies that I've seen in so many places in our time was never part of what I learned, much less the anguish of nightmares, alcoholism and depression, which consumed some who had been victims and some who had been perpetrators in that long ago war. Growing older as a student of history and a would-be journalist, it was the missing details of our own story that nagged away at me. It was largely through accessing in the last few years the military archives at Cockelbrua Barracks in Dublin that I began to have a clearer idea of the psychological cost of the conflict, which in the south of Ireland lasted from 1916 to the end of the Civil War in 1923. I need to say here that I and many others who write about Irish history owe a huge debt of gratitude to those archivists who've compiled and digitized the reports of the Bureau of Military History. I salute these custodians of memory for their rigor, impartiality, their gift to us of the stories that were for so long locked away. And I'm grateful too to scholars like Linda Connolly, Mary McAuliffe, Shifra Aiken, who've examined the hidden suffering of women in the revolutionary period and whose work is an inspiration. As I begin to try and find a more human understanding of what happened in those times and of its consequences for future generations. The concept of trauma as a psychic as well as a physical wound wouldn't appear in scholarship until the latter part of the 19th century, and it would take the cruelties of the Great War to lead to more enlightened evaluations of those previously dismissed as lunatics or cowards. Yet we need to acknowledge that in 1914-18, treatment was aimed at preparing men for a return to the battlefield where at all possible. It wasn't until after the Vietnam War that the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder, an illness that could develop many years after the initial trauma, began to be properly recognised. 
It took still later, well into the 20th century, before the concepts of epigenetic and inherited trauma became widely pursued fields of psychiatric study, as the medical community began to investigate how far into the future the lines of trauma might stretch. When I look into the history of the war that shaped my forebears, I'm seeking facts, not the stifling shrouds of victimhood or heroism. I have no desire nor right to speak for a nation. I'm selfish. I want to know what happened to my own people, the forces that shaped their minds and what they may have passed on to the generations that came after. There is no full study of the trauma experienced by Irish combatants and civilians in those seven years that began with the rising and ended with the last shots of the Civil War. A revolutionary army on the move didn't have a medical corps, much less specialist psychiatrists who could diagnose or treat mental wounds. But there is written evidence of psychological distress in file after file in the military archives, references surface to trouble with nerves or collapse, or that phrase nervous breakdown. The wife of Limerick's murdered Sinn Féin mayor, Koto Callaghan, quotes my old newspaper, The Limerick Leader, reporting in the first six months of 1920, that owing to the tension due to outrages, there was an abnormal number of patients suffering from nervous complaints and disorders. An IRA volunteer remembers that by the war's end, I got a very bad nervous breakdown from which I've never recovered. Another on his release from military custody gave an account that would have echoes for anyone suffering from war-related PTSD. And I quote, when I reached home, I collapsed just for a moment on the stairs to the bedroom. I had barely enough strength to hold on to the banister and foil, avoid, avoid falling. My nerves were completely gone. For the next 18 months, I had the awful experience of being afraid, and it was my first acquaintance with fear. I wanted to get away to the country, but my doctor told me I would have to fight the thing in my ordinary surroundings. I remember one day I was crossing Dame Street when I took a seizure. And when I came to, I was standing in front of a tram car with the driver jumping on the bell and bellowing at me. I had just time to get out of the way. Frequently, I had to ask my wife to accompany me home from the office in the evening. At night, when asleep, if a motor car stopped within hearing distance, I would spring onto the floor. All in all, I had a rotten time. I read the accounts of men and women in the archives, grateful for the human context that moves beyond the accumulation of facts about ambushes and weapons, defeats and victories, captures and narrow escapes. I'm looking for the unadorned accounting of the war and what it did to human minds. Often I find myself stopping at a description whose symptoms I recognize. Claire Hobson recalled. We had a horrible feeling listening to the big guns shelling the city at the end of the week. Somebody came and told us that O'Rahilly was wounded and dying and that he kept calling for water. This had a very bad effect on my nerves and I had a sort of collapse. Dr. Charlie McCauley came out and gave me morphine. He came up again to see me after an hour and had to give me another injection as I was wide awake. A doctor in Dublin was confronted with the dilemma when a young assassin was overwhelmed by trauma. The young man had been one of the killers on Bloody Sunday. And I quote Dr. Vincent Ellis. A day after Bloody Sunday, a young man called to see me with a note signed by the OC company IRA. The note was a request that I should do what I could for the bearer. The bearer was unknown to me. He accompanied me to my room, smoked a cigarette. Then he told me that one of the boys engaged in the executions of that Sunday had become mentally upset and wished to give himself up. He pointed out that should he do this, it would allow the British military intelligence to discover the identity of all or some others involved with dire consequences. I suggested taking the boy into the mental hospital. There was a young woman who was called by the military to identify the body of a young man mutilated by a grenade. The military thought he might be her brother, but it was another young man. And such was her fright on seeing the condition of the corpse that according to the statement, her nerves are affected even to the present time. This was disclosed to military researchers in the 1930s 
a decade after the conflict ended. Fragments of trauma float up endlessly from the pages. The policeman, Sergeant Hamilton in West Cork, who, quote, suffering from his nerves, went almost crazy when we fired the first shots and the remainder of the garrison had to tie him up and secure him. The IRA prisoner, James Maloney, who remember the aftermath of a brutal beating in prison when the men were in a sorry mess and if a match were struck without our knowing, we jumped with our nerves. Or the IRA men who were so affected by the strain which affected their nerves after the ambush at Kilmichael, that they were, and I quote one of their officers, practically useless from that time on. As Linda Connolly has reported, women in the ranks of the guerrilla army or those who were the sisters and mothers of IRA volunteers could be targeted for beatings and sexual violence both in the war against the Crown and the civil war that followed. There's a haunting sentence from the activist Maureen Cormican of County Galway, who recalled during a pension application, her experience of being arrested by the Black and Tans. And I quote from the verbatim report of her encounter with the pensions board. She says, I had to be treated by a doctor from the effects of shock and all this. They treated us badly, they stole and they did everything to us. Anything else? The male questioner asked. I suppose that is all, Maureen replied. I suppose that is all. Afterwards, she was treated by a doctor for trouble with her nerves. Women who fraternized with police or soldiers could have their heads shorn. The same treated was meted out, treatment was meted out by the Crown forces to women suspected of rebel allegiance. The county Sligo nurse, Linda McQuinney, was tortured by an auxiliary who beat me about the head and chest and broke one of my front teeth. A group of young men captured with her were taken out one by one. And she says, we heard a shot each time and we thought it was the end. They were not killed. It was an attempt to psychologically break Nurse Winnie. In the case of IRA volunteer Charles Dalton, we see a man who was physically wounded in 1920, but by 1940 was a permanent resident of a psychiatric hospital due to trauma rooted in the War of Independence. In my own family, my grandmother Hannah Pertle was tasked with smuggling weapons through checkpoints and gathering information on the movements of police and soldiers who were targeted for assassination. Many of them were Irish and wearing the uniform of the Royal Irish Constabulary, and often came from the same rural background as the men and women trying to kill them. Not so the man who turned the tables on my grandmother and ambushed her and another Cumanamon volunteer. This black and tan, whose surname was Darcy, put a gun to her head and told her she would be killed if she didn't leave town. Hannah Pertle did not leave, but she lived in perpetual fear of violence. This was during a period of exceptional terror in and around Listowel. A trainee priest home on Christmas holidays was beaten to death in the town square in plain sight of neighbours. The policeman who did it walked away scot-free. Two black and tans were abducted and tortured. One vanished, buried in a bog. The other was released but suffered a mental breakdown and never went back to police work. Across Ireland, there were bodies bleeding on the street, buried in bogs where they would never be found. Bodies still alive, being beaten and kicked in the cells of barracks. An elderly Anglo-Irish knight suspected of spying for the British was hauled out of his home outside Lestole, had the ritual notice hung around his neck and was shot dead. While behind him, men from my granduncle Mick Pertle's IRA unit walked through the mansion with petrol cams and set it ablaze. One of McPurtle's close friends had been shot in an ambush nearby. It was too dangerous to try and bring him to safety. So his anguished comrades had to leave him behind, bleeding to death in a ditch. Much of this happened in the wake of the murder of District Inspector Tobias O'Sullivan, a County Galway man, the green shadow in the ghost story of my childhood. A father of three young children, killed within sight of his front door leaving a traumatized family. It also haunted some of the men who had murdered him. 
On the side of the government, many of those inflicting violence and trauma were themselves veterans of the horrors of the Western Front. The black and tan or auxiliary policemen who'd served time in the charnel houses of the Somme and Ypres and Passchendaele, and who found himself facing ambush on the roads of Kerry and West Cork, was entering a very different war, but one no less straining on the nerves. I think of a particular story I uncovered in Listole about an auxiliary veteran named Charles Ingledew. He and three other policemen were drinking in Susie Hannan's pub. They were enjoying themselves, she recalled. She saw Ingledew take out his resolver, revolver. He began playing with it. I was frightened and asked one of his friends to tell him to put it away. The friend said it was quite safe. Ingledew was almost certainly drunk. As he played with the gun, he asked the others, what would the old head say if he saw this? A reference probably to Tobias O'Sullivan, the recently murdered district inspector. Ingledew blew out the candle on the table in front of them. It was relit. He blew it out again. In that moment of darkness, there was a shot. We were all of us chatting in a friend, friendly manner, Constable Andrew Sheridan told the subsequent inquiry. At a moment when the room was in darkness, I heard a shot, which I first thought was outside, so I ducked. When the candle was lit again, Ingledew was lying dead on the floor with a bullet wound to his forehead. The coroner's court returned a verdict of accidental shooting. But what really killed child Charles Ingledew? veteran of the Western Front and of the dirty war in North Kerry. He was a troubled and obviously traumatized man. He was still in Listole two weeks after his discharge from the police. I am tempted to believe that war was the only home he now knew. I've referred to the killing of District Inspector O'Sullivan and that was one of a number of attacks around Listol which left deep trauma in their wake. The shooting dead of three unarmed IRA volunteers by Black and Tans at Gerta Glana, immortalised in the ballad The Valley of Nocanure, is another. And among the most poignantly remembered by the perpetrators, and many of the townspeople, was the execution of James Kane, a retired RIC sergeant, now working as a fisheries inspector, and suspected of passing information about the IRA to his old comrades in the police. I quote here from my own written account of what happened, and it's taken from the, largely from the statement of Brian O'Grady, who was, uh, took the Free State side in the Civil War, uh, and then became the bodyguard uh, to Kevin O'Higgins and was with him on the day that he was assassinated. Uh, this whole story is a, is a it's clearly poignant, but also deep with meaning when one considers the circles of violence. It was a beautiful summer's evening when they set out in the direction of Nocanur to carry out the killing. Volunteer Brian O'Grady met the priest called to give the dead man the last rites. He asked me what reason was the prisoner being sentenced to death for? I replied, I don't know, Father. The order has come from GHQ, and that is all we know of the matter. He then asked if the man's life could be spared. I informed him we had no option but to obey the order, and I added, we would rather be surrounded by the enemy fighting for our lives than to have to give effect to the order. But we had implicit confidence in our intelligence officers that there was no mistake being made, and this was our consolation. Brian O'Grady remembered the priest saying, very good, Brian, God bless you, before he left. The man who was guarding James Kane came to O'Grady and asked him to read the condemned man's will. He couldn't do it himself, as he was too well known to the prisoner. And, I quote, under the circumstances, it's right that a stranger should read it. Every line of O'Grady's testimony feels haunted though he describes the prisoner as quite normal when they meet. After O'Grady read the will, Cain asked if he was sure it would be delivered to his family. I replied, yes, I give you my word of honour, it will be delivered. James Cain had a last request of his killers, 
When they killed him, would they leave him as near to his hometown of Listow as they could? I told him we would do everything possible to comply with his request, O'Grady recalled. At midnight they all left and travelled towards the main road. A scout was sent ahead. Con Brosnan pointed out a shortcut through the fields. The imagery of the night sat with O'Grady long after the event. He wrote, It was a glorious night in early June, like one stolen from the tropics. The larks were singing all night, and the northern sky was aglow with light from the aurora borealis. Then the lights disappeared. Darkness came and they knew dawn was near. Cain was allowed to dictate a last letter to his children. My dear children, I am condemned to die. I had the priest today, thank God. I give you all my blessing and pray God may protect you all. Pray for me and get some masses said for me. Don't go to much expensive funeral and have no drink or public wake. I'm told my body will be got near home. I got the greatest kindness from the men who were in charge of me. Goodbye and God bless you and God bless Ireland. Pray for me constantly. And give my love to all my friends and neighbours and thank them for all their kindness to me. Goodbye from loving father James Cain. All my dear children. Bury me near my loving wife if possible. Give my gold watch to Eddie and the watch in the desk to Frank. Then the condemned man and his executioners knelt together and said the rosary. He was blindfolded. He was shot by the four men. A note warning spies beware was attached to his body, which was left where he had fallen. The killers walked back through the fields. Nobody seems to have spoken until they reached a safe distance from the road. When Brian O'Grady remarked to Dennis Quill, a brave man died tonight. I thoroughly agree with you, Quill replied. Then they rested, smoked, and in O'Grady's words, blessed the man who discovered tobacco. I know that at least two of the men who took part in the killings of District Inspector O'Sullivan and of James Kane were haunted by the events long afterwards. A relative of Con Brosnan, Kerry football hero, later a Free State Army officer, described how Con went into the church every day of his life and prayed for the men he had killed. He suffered from alcoholism and depression in later life. There is no way at this distance of establishing that his mental issues were rooted in the war. The same is true of my own grandmother who battled depression as she grew older. I am aware that what I say next is speculative. But I do wonder if people like Con Brosnan, Hannah Pertle, people who had no previous experience of violence, no military training, and no access to any mental health services, in the immediate aftermath of the war, could have been unaffected by what they experienced. And it's important to note here that when one war ended, another began. The Civil War brought violence to Kerry on a scale that went beyond anything experienced during the time of the Black and Tans. This was war where prisoners were murdered by being tied to landmines and blown to pieces, bayoneted in prison cells shot while surrendering and hurled down cliffs. My grandmother and her comrades followed the Free State. Some of her closest friends went with the Republican forces. The emotional sundering that took place in this small community is impossible to quantify. The British veterans of the war left these shores, but the Irish men and women who'd fought in the ranks of the IRA the IR and the RIC in the Free State Army and in the Republican anti-treaty forces emerged from conflict into an exhausted reality. The imperative was the survival of the new state. There was simply no room to consider the emotional needs of those who lived with nightmares and flashbacks and depression or who medicated their trauma with alcohol and pills. Nor was it possible to create a collective memory with which people who fought on all sides could live. The wars of the revolutionary period exposed the battles within. Some who fought for the Republic went into exile. Others stayed at home to live with the bitterness of defeat. 
While the files in the military archives illuminate a world of pain, they are largely devoted to the experiences of those fighting for the revolution. There is a great silence where the voices of the defeated are concerned. I remember visiting once a relative of an RIC man shot during those times and asking if she'd ever told her family's story before. Nobody ever asked was the poignant response. Free Staters, Republicans, ex-RIC, might have shared the name of Irish men and women, but their memories of the wars were so shaded by the bitterness of killing that it would have been impossible to conceive in the circumstances of those times, a process of truth and reconciliation that would have enabled an honest emotional accounting of the time. Trauma has been part of war since the earliest written accounts of conflict, from Homer to Shakespeare to the poets of the Great War, and later, the dead haunt the living. My own experiences of war left me traumatized. They inflicted considerable damage on my mental health. It is that personal experiences which encourages in me compassion for those traumatized by the years of war on this island but also drives me to devote more research in the future to the impact of emotions on the causes and the course of war. And I realize I'm at a very early stage. If trauma is to be overcome in the North of Ireland, there will be, there already are many personal journeys to undertake. And I realize even using that phrase, trauma to be overcome, <laughs> how, glib it actually sounds. We cannot close the door on the past. I'm, I'm always frustrated by that phrase, the need to bring closure. Closure of what? We're talking about individual lives, individual journeys in which there may or may not be healing or degrees of healing. But I feel now it is important that we undertake the journeys of truth that couldn't be undertaken in the South after the War of Independence and the Civil War. The healing of trauma isn't just an individual journey. It needs to be supported, most obviously by the medical services of the state, by the efforts of voluntary support groups, by governments and by society at large, which accept that the costs of conflict can endure for generations. We live in far more enlightened times but the recognition and treatment of mental health problems is concerned. I recently visited the WAVE Trauma Support Centre in Belfast. What an inspiring group of people I met, treating the pain of those experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder without reference to where in the community they come from or what side, if any, they took. But beyond the financial and structural support for those traumatised, there's something more we can do we must speak of war as it actually is, put all mythologizing to one side, make the moral leap, however uncomfortable, and try to see the blood pooling on a kitchen floor, the scattering of flesh on branches, the haunted days and nights of those who live on after the wars. With the young men we sometimes see nowadays shouting loyalist paramilitary slogans or chanting, ooh, ah, up the ra, really be so full of voice if they knew what war was really like. Maybe a few would, but most I argue would recoil from their jingoism and recognize the pain it causes to those living with the trauma of the troubles. We can rebuild broken cities and towns, build factories and create jobs, open parliaments and have democratic votes. But I believe we have to do more. We must strive for openness about the psychological costs of conflict. And when we look through that myth mythical door that is supposed to be closed on the past, let us look through it with clear eyes. I'm going to conclude with a quote from a great Cork writer, but a writer of universal themes and, and, and gifts, Frank O'Connor and his great story of the War of Independence. Guests of the nation, 
in which he describes the killing of two English prisoners after a long uh, incarceration or uh, being closed away with their IRA captors and a period during which the captured and the captors got to know each other and got to recognize each other's humanity. And the end of the story is the narrator in a bog where the men were buried. And it encapsulates my own experience of warfare, of what seeing up close the true horror and of violence being inflicted can, can leave a human being with. Here from guests of the nation. With me, it was the other way, as though the patch of bog where the two Englishmen were was a thousand miles away from me, and even noble mumbling just behind me, and the old woman and the birds and the bloody stars were all far away, and I was somehow very small and very lonely. And anything that ever happened to me after, I never felt the same about again. Thank you. Virgil, thank you. Um, I don't think you could ever be regarded as glib uh, in any of the observations you've made. Um, although it does strike me in, in some of the discussions we've been having both over the course of this weekend and previously, we, we talk somewhat glibly about the relatively low levels of violence uh, that took place in the course of the Irish Revolution. Um, I think what you've just done is to remind us that there's not really any such thing. But I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on what collectively we should do about that. Right at the beginning of this weekend, John Horne, who's in your audience now, chaired a panel on how we should think about the actions of Crown forces, how they should be remembered here and on the neighboring island. But in the course of that, unsurprisingly, came up the subject of the possibility of commemoration of the RIC in particular. I wonder what reflections you have on that, if any, given, given the so empathy you, the, you show in talking the, about Tobias. Some of my, uh, I missed part of that question because it says the internet connection is unstable. Could you repeat the last part of the question? I was, I was wondering about how you feel or what you feel is possible in relation to commemoration of, of the RIC in particular. You know, I'm, I'm really troubled by all the, by the kind of terminology which we, we trapped ourselves with at the beginning of all of this. Um, commemoration, celebration. Well, what I would have wanted was, what I've argued for throughout this, is an honest telling of the past, is a period in which we wholeheartedly embraced complexity. It's, I think of Louis McNeese's phrase, you know, this, this island um, from Autumn Journey, which will be pigeonholed people into patriots and villains, sheep and ghosts, goats, you know. Um, and any, it, it, it has to be our primary imperative to put the, the truth of what happened and recognition of, of the extraordinary suffering which was experienced on both sides. And yes, you know, you, you refer there to casualty figures that they were certainly by the standards of what was happening in Central Europe at the time. You look at the massive population transfers taking place in the Balkans, the massacres in places like Smyrna, all at, all at the same, same time. The, the number of deaths were small, but look at the kind of the countryside, look at the, the small communities in which these killings were taking place. And this has a profound resonance, of course, for what's happening or what has happened in Northern Ireland during the 30 years of the trouble there. Very large rocks dropped into tiny pools and the ripples are massive and leave damage, emotional damage, leave trauma in communities for generations afterwards. And I regret that we got into this debate about who were the heroes and who were the villains. Surely to God we can move beyond that, you know, and, and, uh, and say what happened. Robert Lowell's phrase, yet and yet, why not say what happened? And let people trust the Irish people to be mature enough to make judgments of their own. 
instead of this reductive, well, they were awful and they shouldn't be remembered. And these things happened. The violence that was inflicted on both sides happened. Let us say what happened and not have to elevate people to, or denigrate them as a consequence. It just frustrates me, this, this perpetual need to turn it into a political battle. And we'll invite other people to, to, to ask questions through the, through the chat. Why don't you, one question that came up was, was what, is, what has it done to your sense of, of whether you're thinking about this, whether violence is ever justified? I mean, what, what do you conclude about, about that? Again, it's one of those questions, you know, which is like, is it right or wrong? Was it right for them to take up arms and wrong for them to take up arms? I'm not interested in that anymore. I've seen too much of it. Okay. I will tell you about violence and what it does. Make up your own mind. I'm not going to be the pretend to be an oracle who has a holy truth. I can tell you that I hate war. I despise it. And I loathe jingoism. I loathe, I loathe those who, who celebrate death and killing. That is the consequence of trauma for me. I just, I'm up to here with it, with, with killing and death. So don't ask me if I think it's justified. I'm past that. One of the other things that you talked about was the sort of the, the supernatural as a way of remembering that kind of trauma. And it's interesting, I, also in your audience at the moment is Sean Boyne, who wrote a book called The Execution of Bridget Noble uh, about the abduction and the killing of a woman on the Barrow Peninsula here in Cork. And one of the things he brings out, and maybe if Sean's still on, he'll talk about it, is, is how although the, her body has never been recovered in popular memory, sightings of her persist. Um, and it's, I'm interested in, I mean, this is, in, in your thinking of whether that's uh, in the absence of the sort of support that you're describing, that's a useful... And you see that profoundly in the famine period, where I, I've been researching what happened in, in Ballydonoghue, Les Elton, which is the parish from which my grandmother came, uh, and her brother Mick, um, who, who also fought in the War of Independence period from which they came. Ghost stories were how people in that part of the world mediated the horror of what they experienced. And for many, the shame of survival. Because if you survived in one part of Ballydon, who 95% of the population was wiped out, that left 5% you know, of people who were extremely tough and extremely lucky. We don't know how they survived. There, that's another one of the great unknown stories. But, you know, again and again as a child, I, I recall, um, you know, being told stories of, of the famine period and stories which of their nature um, had to be, you know, because they were being told by people who'd grown up, my grandmother, in, for example, who'd grown up with living witnesses uh, to the famine. So they were told with an edge of bitterness and they were told with... Um, in a very, I suppose, a very cut and dried, very black and white way. It was about the, the, the murderous British government and cruel landlords. There wasn't space in those, in those stories for the kind of complexities which attended the famine or the, and particularly the aftermath, when one looked at who did well and who inherited land and who was able to improve their situation. Um, and it, it, you know, it's very clear to me that the ghost story, as such, took the place of a kind of factual accounting, contemporary factual accounting by the people themselves, because that was what was necessary in order to survive psychologically, to move on. I don't know if 
if others have questions, there's an interesting observation from from Dernal Larry about the the distinction between the as it were the, the you were describing and and more recent violence. And as he puts it at the end, what that says about these uh, these discontinuities, as he calls them. Um, I'm looking here does at. It, does it matter what the ceremony of of the violence is? The, the sorry, the, when you say the ceremony of the violence, violence. violence. Um, it, 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 Donal, Donal is pointing to a sort of distinction between the uh, the, the religious the, the the saying of the rosary with the the prisoner, and that that in a way is is suggests a sort of premeditation it's quite chilling in a way and differentiating it from more secular as he puts it killing more recently um i'm, I'm not sure maybe donald can come off mute and yeah. please don't more Thanks about your message hi can you hear me now Yes, indeed, I can hear sorry. you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. no, I, I, I was just struck by I mean, the the account which, uh, of, of the saying the rosary, and of course it reminded me of Guests of the Nation, that uh, it's it's on the one hand it's sort of sentimental and uh, it shows a, a sort of a final uh, measure of restraint before killing, which is also very chilling. So it's a combination of being both sentimental and chilling at the same time. Whereas I, I've I've just said that. In the 1969-1990s period, it seemed uh, uh, that if you were caught um, by the if you were in the security forces and caught, you were on a conveyor belt to death. That yeah. there was nothing could save you. You know, unlike General Lucas, who might be taking off fish, taking uh, taking off somewhere fishing uh, uh, in the hope of some release of some kind of deal. That in the 1969-1990s period, um, uh, you know that that seems to me anyway that that just could not happen, uh, and that that might be partly due to the the, the uh, different security forces approach. But it it just strikes me that 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 sort of much more secular, much colder in many ways, uh, um, which in some ways might be easier to kill people if you're uh, cold blooded in that sense than if you're saying the rosary with them. It must be very difficult when you actually can come to know them as in guests of the nation. And that's the, the point of, uh, I'm trying to get, I'm not expressing it very well. No, but, I, uh, I that's what exactly I, what you mean. I mean, I think for me, the um, the, the striking thing about the, the killings in and around Listole in the period is that they fall into, a, into three categories. One was people killing people they really knew. Um, and it, 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 when you listen to the testimony of Brian O'Grady, he talks about reading the will because the other man to whom the will was given knew came too well mm. and there was this there was this sense that he would be somehow invading the man's privacy he's about to kill him yes he still, yeah. he still doesn't want to invade his privacy by seeing what he what he has in the world what he's going to leave behind and we yes. all know in rural communities mm. the importance of, of a will and, and and the kind of secrets uh, that yes. can be attached to it. so you have that and then this this extraordinary moment of them saying the rosary and my question was, when I, when I first read that, who was that prayer for? Mm. Was it for the killers or was it for the man who was about to be killed? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you're shooting, you're blowing a man's brains out. Uh, yeah. um, but the seconds beforehand, you're holding a, a rosary beads. And in that, when you, when the more you delve into that testimony, you see the kind of possibilities and probabilities um, of later trauma. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, maybe two more questions that have come up. One, um, and then Roy, one from David Reynolds. I mean, talking about the impact as you have done on the perpetrators as well as the victims and their family, I mean, from the work that you've done, how much have you discerned about what perpetrators of violence thought it would be like afterwards? Ah, I think one of the most interesting periods and, and for me afterwards traumatizing I didn't realize it at the time was I, I spent around three weeks speaking to perpetrators of the genocide in, in Rwanda some of these were men who'd been released after attending truth and reconciliation commissions in their villages 
uh, and others were men who were still in jail, um, all of whom had been sentenced. So they had nothing to gain at all um, from lying to me. And I sat with them uh, day after day. And I think the thing that was most striking to me was the sense of shock that they still lived with, that they couldn't quite come to terms with what they had done. I met a handful of people who were true believers, who were genuine ideologues and uh, who believed that the Tutsi minority in the case of this conflict were people who deserved to be wiped from the face of the earth, but they were very few. I've always said with, with war, um, you know, if we, if it was only a question of the psychopaths, I wouldn't be bothered. It's what people like you and me in the wrong circumstances, subjected to the uh, conditioning of propaganda, of circumstance, you know, poverty, perhaps invasion, uh, a, a slow process of, of, of brutalization and, uh, and dehumanization. It's what we're capable of. That's the thing that bothers me. And that's what struck me when talking to the perpetrators of the Rwandan violence. I, I think that if you had spoken to any of them um, three months before the violence and suggested that they were, in the case of one man, capable of chasing a 10-year-old boy into a banana grove, beating him to death, as they thought, then walking away and hearing him mumbling and, and moving in the grave, the map in the shallow grave they'd put him into, and then returning to finish off the job. He wouldn't have believed you, that killer. And after the killing, in this case, it was three or so years afterwards, he still couldn't believe what he had done. Um, and there, therein lies the heart of trauma in many respects. It's asking the perpetrators as well as the victims, to accept what happened, and to accept the reality of what happened. I keep coming back to this. David? Well, just to follow up, thank you, but I mean, did, I mean, to go back to your Irish examples, yeah. in advance of the act, did these men understand what was involved in blowing mm -hmm. out somebody's brains? It's, <clears throat> if you look at that, um, you know, the, the, the records for that period, people begin joining the Irish volunteers. Um, you know, the, my, my own grandfather, for example, he joins the Gaelic League, then he joins the Irish volunteers. None of them, as I, as I said in my talk, had any prior experience mm. in, of violence. Now, there was a tradition, one has to, to state this, there was a tradition of agrarian violence in the area. Uh, during the land war, during the last part of the 19th century, there were ample examples of uh, people being ambushed, beaten up, in some cases killed uh, in disputes over land, um, cattle regularly being attacked. There was a long tradition of rural violence going back into the, into the 18th century uh, in the area. But that doesn't explain for me how somebody like my grandmother could go from being a 20-year-old you know, draper's assistant in the town of Listowel into somebody who was now tracking um, policemen, Irish policemen, providing guns to the IRA to, to, to facilitate assassinations. Or our neighbour, uh, Con Brosnan, who could become a man who would walk up behind a policeman and blow out his brains. You need to understand the rapidly escalating nature of violence during that period. Um, uh, late 1920 and the first months of 1921 in and around that area. When suddenly, killing and i've always there's a there's a the phrase i'm not sure whose it is that moment when history slips its leash somebody has described mm. uh, when all of those kind of hidden propensities uh, and possibilities of violence are suddenly given air are suddenly brought out into the open by circumstance by the pace of events and so when you get you know this uh, the killing of a, of a policeman leads to a reprisal. And this whole politics um, of reprisal and tit for tat violence escalates. And very quickly, people who were not natural born killers, if one, one can use that phrase, find themselves doing things they couldn't possibly um, have imagined a few months before. So is this kind of mentality of kill or be killed? In other words, you've got to, I've got to kill before I get killed. Well, there is that, and there's also rage, okay? And it is certainly the, the activities of the Black and Tans in and around uh, North Kerry uh, and, the, and the auxiliaries, uh, you know, were 
absolutely calculated to produce a, a level of public rage, which tapped into deeper, older atavistic feelings. That is, that is my, my sense of what happened. And once that, once you start a process, and whether that's in North Kerry in 1920 or, or it's, in, it's in the former Yugoslavia in the early 1990s, once you start killing, it's frighteningly, um, it, it, it's frightening just how quickly good people get pulled into, its, into a circular kind of violence that goes on and on until people are exhausted. It's not just, as I keep saying, it's not just about whether they're in, in uniform or out of uniform, a handful of psychopaths. War is never about that. Michael, before I ask Roy to come in with his question, Heather Jones asks a very interesting one. I mean, what, what, given the power of what you've described, the need to describe violence as it really is, what are the factors that prevent us collectively telling the truth about war? And, and what can we do about them? Um, because there's so many things. There's, I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the aftermath of the, of the War of Independence and the Civil War of the Irish Revolution period, um, there just wasn't room. You know, in those years immediately afterwards, there was too much bitterness. There was too much exhaustion. It was Kevin O'Higgins' famous phrase: "The wild men were at the door, and there was a this handful of young men inside, trying to hold a state together." And, and so much of what had been done was so brutal that there was no way it would have been articulated. And then as governments changed, it didn't suit. And the, the, the conflict erupts in Northern Ireland um, in 1969, going back to the brutalities that had uh, taken place on both sides in, in the War of Independence and in the Civil War. You know, there were massive political issues around airing those questions during the, the, the period of the Troubles. Um, we're past that, I believe. We're past that. And we're into a place where honest accounting is possible. We're not there yet, certainly, in terms of Northern Ireland. And that's a whole other discussion that I'm not going to go into today. But it is, uh, it's, it is significant and must be addressed. Roy. Well, I wanted to ask about honest accounting or just to make a comment about honest accounting. Thank you, Fergal. That was such a powerful testimony. But I wonder if you agree that one way forward is what you've been doing, but also with those great compilations, David McKittrick's Lost Lives mm -hmm. about Northern Ireland, O'Halpin and O'Coran's recent the, the Dead of the Irish Revolution. I think also of Anne Dolan's work, the uncompromising accounting of what actually happened seems to me, and you've done it yourself in Wounds, a step forward in Irish historiography where previous accounts were always so inflected one way or the other. I do, I do see an advance in that I think the attempt to make the honest account, no matter how uncompromising and upsetting it is, as is true both of your book and, and, uh, and of the works I've mentioned, it, it, it does seem to me one, one way forward, one step forward in what has traditionally been a, a very highly coloured historiography. I think that's right. Um, but it can't, it, it, and, and it, it may be all we get in terms of, of what happened um, during the War of Independence and the Civil War. Um, but in the North, it has to be something bigger. I'm not quite sure what it's going to be. Um, you look at uh, and I've had personal experience of truth and reconciliation commissions in uh, in South Africa, particularly, but also observing them in, in Latin America and other places. We don't have that same same kind of culture of public redemptive truth telling, or truth telling with a redemptive kind of almost religious um, end. It's impossible to see a Desmond Tutu figure, for example, emerging in Northern Ireland to stand in front of a of a commission where former IRA men and former UVF men and former British Special Forces stand and talk of the killings that they took part in. I just can't see that happening. Um, and so I'm left. You know, one of the one of the great mistakes reporters make and people make about reporters is that they think there's an answer to every question. I can't see one right now. I cannot see one right now where you are able to take the past out into the light um, and give people 
I was about to say that awful word closure. I won't. If you give people the facts, which I believe are part of the roadblock we might erect against further outbreaks of violence, against further killing on our island. Thank you. Fargal, on that point, let me thank you on behalf of everybody. Um, you, we end on a, on a, on a somber note, um, but thank you for helping us to reflect on the reality of the things that sometimes get talked about, as Roy says, either in a very coloured way or in a, an artificially detached sort of way. Um, we're in your debt. Thank you to, to from the, the non Corkonians for not being triumphalist. Um, that was generous. It was right. It was the big thing to do. Big thing, exactly. Truth and reconciliation, healing, closure. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. And thank you to everybody who's been uh, participating over the course of the, the Virtual History Festival. Um, as they don't quite say at Passover, next year in Skibbereen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.